On the continent of Arganesson, within a stone spire older than the human race, a cabal of dragons hold a heated debate about the interpretation of a certain prophecy. In a jungle deep within the lands of Jendrik, a silver dragon plays a macabre game of chess against a giant using its frozen victims as chess pieces. On the continent of Sarlona, a battalion of Redran soldiers are driven away from the borders of Adar by a hurricane conjured by an unseen draconic sentinel. Whilst on the other side of the world, in the city of Fairhaven, a crime lord strikes a bargain with a government official. One of them is unaware that the other is a dragon in human form who has been hidden in plain sight since before the rise of Galifar. Eberron is a world created and shaped by dragons. Their will and machinations have guided and altered the fate of lesser races since the genesis of the world. Hello adventurers, and welcome to the next installment of Eberron Historian. Today we are taking an in-depth look at the dragons of Eberron. From their rich history and role in the creation of the world, and the many unique aspects that set them apart from the dragons of other D&D settings. Please remember to hit those like and subscribe buttons below if you're enjoying our content, and switch notifications on to stay up to date as we release new lectures in the future. Let's get started. Like other D&D settings, the dragons of Eberron come in many colors, both metallic and chromatic. But unlike other settings, there is no rivalry between metallic and chromatic dragons, and dragons of any color can lean towards any alignment. Like most races of Eberron, a dragon's alignment and personality is defined by its deeds rather than having an inherent nature. As one of Eberron's first races, the dragons have a long and colorful history that plays a major part in the flavor of the Eberron setting. If you've watched our brief history of the History of Eberron video, You'll recall how the three progenitor dragons, Eberron, Kaiba, and Sibiris, created the world of Eberron before Kaiba betrayed their sibling and killed Sibiris. Link below if you haven't seen it yet. As Sibiris' body fell across the skies and formed the ring around the world of Eberron, it is said that their blood rained down upon Eberron's body, which now formed the world. As the mystical power of Sibiris' blood hit the vibrant life force of Eberron, they combine to give birth to the race of mortal dragons. As the blood passed through raging storm clouds, the blue dragons emerged. Where it rained down on Swampland, the first black wormlings crawled forth. Red and gold dragons came forth out of the volcanoes where the blood fell, and so on. Over the land that would become Sarlona, however, something more amazing happened. The pure blood of Sibiris gave birth to another form of creature before it struck the world the Coatles. Unlike the dragons, the Coatles were born immortal and existed outside the cycle of mortal life. In the age to come, the Coatle would become the dragon's greatest ally against the demonic overlords of Kaiba. In the early years of the Age of Demons, the dragon flights of the world were still scattered, divided, and commonly fighting among themselves. As the Archfiends and their legions of followers arose from the depths of Kaiba, the dragons were caught off guard and were easily conquered. For hundreds of thousands of years, the dragons were subject to slavery and servitude at the hands of the demons, and the world became a hellscape. The turning point of the age came when a blue dragon named Orolonistrix and a coatl named Hezkalipa together discovered patterns in the sky, stars, and earth that they regarded to be the manifest wisdom of the progenitor dragons Eberron and Sibiris, a map of possible futures. Orolonistrix dubbed this phenomenon the Draconic Prophecy, and using it they were able to gain great insight into the weaknesses and vulnerabilities of the Archfiends and their machinations. This discovery also gave the dragons hope, and they were now united with purpose and driven forwards believing that they were carrying out the will of the progenitors. The dragons won the war against the demons at great cost. The Coatl resorted to sacrificing most of their race in order to create the Silver Flame and seal the Archfiends away. With the Coatl now absent, the dragons became the dominant race of Eberron. Following the Age of Demons, the dragons entered an age of great expansion as their numbers increased and they spread across the lands of Eberron. As they spread, they would encounter many developing races of Eberron, such as the Giants, Goblins, and Dwarves. Some of the dragons set out to study them, 
and in some cases even began to teach the ways of the arcane to the fledgling civilizations. However, most of the dragons chose the path of conquest and set out to carve out their own dominions across the world. This soon led to rivalries and eventually war, and once again they began to fight among themselves. Previously, during the war against the demons, the most feared of the Archfiends was known as Tiamat, the daughter of Kaiba. Tiamat was able to tap into the small part of the progenitor dragon Kaiba that existed within all mortal dragons. During the war, she succeeded in turning many dragons against their own allies with her corrupting influence. With the Silver Flame unleashed, Tiamat was sealed away within the dragon's home continent of Arganesson, deep within the Pit of Five Sorrows. With the dragons once again divided and wantonly unleashing their arcane powers, Tiamat's influence was able to spread forward from her prison and began to once again corrupt some of the dragons. Fortunately, through the efforts of the vigilant factions of dragons known as the Eyes of Chronepsis and the Light of Sibiris, the corrupted dragons were destroyed and the scattered flights of dragons around the world were recalled to Arganesson as the elders decreed that the dragons must exercise restraint in their expansionism and use of magic to prevent Tiamat from wreaking havoc once again. This creed of isolation and observation has only been broken by the dragons once, for the devastation of Gendrik. Despite the demands from some that they should intervene, the dragons chose not to get involved with the giant's war with the Cori. The prophecy foretold of the giant's cataclysmic spell that would shatter a moon and displace the plain of Dalcor, but still, the dragons held firm and let it happen. However, as the giants prepared to use the same magic to fight against the uprising of the elves, the prophecy foretold destruction of such scale that Arganesson could no longer sit idle and watch. And so it went. The dragons emerged en masse for the last time in recorded history, and the continent of Zendrik was scoured and desolated. The dragons considered it their own folly for teaching the giants the ways of the arcane in the first place, and from that day onwards, they decreed that they would never again teach their secrets of magic to the lesser races. With the elves now free from slavery under the giants, refugees made their way to the continent of Arenel, and over the millennia, their new civilization flourished under an arcane theocracy known as the Undying Court. Harnessing positive energy from the plain of Irian, their religion would immortalize their most valued elders in holy undeath, bringing their people untold gestalt power that would even begin to rival the archfiends of the Age of Demons. The dragons took notice, and although never descending upon Erenel in full force like they did with Gendrik, they have been skirmishing on and off with the Undying Court for the past 25,000 years. Why the dragons have maintained this stretched out conflict instead of simply destroying the elves as they did with the giants is unknown. Some theorize that the dragons are tempering the elves to face a greater threat. Others simply think that the dragons use it as a sport or proving grounds. Whatever the reason, the motivations of the dragons remain a mystery to this day. Through the end of the Age of Demons and the Age of Giants, the dragons acted as the guardians of Eberron, directly coming into conflict with the forces that threaten the balance of the world. Since then, however, the dragons' machinations have been far more subtle and usually unseen. As Eberron came into the modern age, the draconic prophecy would begin to reveal itself in a new form with the appearance of the dragon marks. Although unknown to the lesser races, the dragons found that the prophecy is now revealed through the actions and fates of dragon-marked individuals and this revelation caused shock and surprise across Arganesson. The Dragon Conclave quickly gathered and debated what to do in response. Many of the more radical groups, like the Light of Sibiris, wanted to hunt down and destroy the dragon-marked individuals to prevent the forces of evil from manipulating the prophecy. But others insisted that the marks were the will of the progenitor Eberron, and to destroy them would be blasphemy. As the Conclave considered, a new group of young dragons came forward and challenged the long-standing creed of inaction and conservatism. This new age of prophecy carried upon mortal flesh required a new creed, one of close observation and even direct manipulation of the lesser races in order to preserve the prophecy. After long consideration, 
the Conclave concurred and gave the young group of dragons permission to test their theories under strict guidelines, to do so without provoking Tiamat or alerting the lesser races. The group established a headquarters in Arganesson dubbed the Tapestry and named themselves Calamarix, or in the common tongue, the Chamber. The Chamber would send its members across the world to closely monitor the dragon marked, manipulate the lesser races from the shadows, and oppose the Lords of Dust and any others who would seek to subvert the draconic prophecy for their own ends. Over the course of the last 3,000 years, the Chamber has infiltrated the societies of Corvair at all levels, with the continent seemingly being the nexus of dragon-marked activity. Secrecy is paramount, and members of the Chamber go to great lengths to ensure that the lesser races stay oblivious to their deeds. Someone who discovers a dragon's identity may find themselves experiencing magic-induced amnesia, or they may even disappear entirely. Whilst the Chamber's members monitor the draconic prophecy in the movements of the Dragon Marks, other dragons continue to study the prophecy as they have always done, in the patterns and signs observed in the Earth, Air and Stars. To assist them in this, the dragons have created immense planar observatories. Mostly found on Arganesson, with a few scattered around Corvair, the planar observatories consist of chambers lined with crystal and metal, often with transparent or open roofs, allowing the night sky to be easily viewed. The rooms are outfitted with enormous orreries that track not just the moon and stars, but also the ring of Sibiris and the position of the 13 planes. The observatories outside of Arganesson are hidden away atop impassable mountains and within deep forest clearings. I hope you enjoyed part one of this series on the dragons of Eberron. In part two, we will take a look at the dragons of the continents of Sarlona and Jendrik. If you like this Planar Observatory battle map you see now, you can pick it up for free by visiting our Patreon page. And while you're there, please consider becoming a patron. By dropping a few dollars, you can help bankroll this video series, as well as picking up a copy of the soundtrack that you've heard throughout this video. As always, a big thank you to the loyal patrons who have stayed on since the start of this series. And don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel with notifications on so you can catch the next installment when it's released. Happy rolling adventurers, and I will see you soon.